When I was growing up, we used to get American TV shows rebroadcast on our stations. Doogie Howser, MD, Murder, She Wrote, Rescue 9 on None with William Shatner. Most of them were dubbed into African languages. ALF was in Afrikansas. Transformers was in Sotho, but if you wanted to watch them in English, the original American audio would be simulcast on the radio. You could mute your TV and listen to that. Watching those shows, I realized that whenever Black people were on screen speaking in African languages, they felt familiar to me. They sounded like they were supposed to sound. Then I'd listen to them in simulcast on the radio, and they would all have Black American accents. My perception of them changed. They didn't feel familiar. They felt like foreigners. Language brings with it an identity and a culture, or at least the perception of it. A shared language says we're the same. A language barrier says we're different. The architects of apartheid understood this. Part of the effort to divide Black people was to make sure we were separated not just physically, but by language as well. In the Bantu schools, children were only taught in their home language. Zulu kids learn in Zulu. Toswana kids learn in Toswana. Because of this, we'd fall into the trap the government had set for us and fight among ourselves, believing that we were different. If you're racist and you meet someone who doesn't look like you, the fact that he can't speak like you reinforces your racist perceptions. He's different, less intelligent. However, the great thing about language is that you can just as easily use it to do the opposite, convince people that they are the same. If the person who doesn't look like you speaks like you, your brain short circuits the racism code of if he doesn't look like me, he isn't like me, suddenly smashes against the language code. If he speaks like me, he is like me. Something is off and it could be hard to figure out. So chapter four, chameleon. Nearly 1 million people lived in Soweto. 99.9% of them were black. And then there was me. I was famous in my neighborhood just because of the color of my skin. I was so unique, people would give directions using me as a landmark. The house on Makalima Street, at the corner, you'll see a light-skinned boy. Take a right there. Whenever the kids in the street saw me, they'd yell, Indoda, Yugulaminga. I probably botched that. I'm sorry. The white man. Some of them would run away. Others would call out to their parents to come look. Others would run up and try to touch me to see if I was real. It was pandemonium. What I didn't understand at the time was that other kids genuinely had no clue what a white person was. Black kids in the township didn't leave the township. Few people had television. They'd seen the white police roll through, but they'd never dealt with a white person face to face, ever. As a kid, I understood that people were different colors, but in my head, white and black and brown were like types of chocolate. Dad was the white chocolate, mom was the dark chocolate, and I was the milk chocolate. But we were all just chocolate. I didn't know any of it had anything to do with race. I didn't know what race was. My mother never referred to my dad as white or to me as mixed. So when the other kids in Soweto called me white, even though I was light brown, I just thought they had their colors mixed up like they hadn't learned them properly. I soon learned that the quickest way to bridge the race gap was through language. Soweto was a melting pot, families from different tribes and homelands. Most kids in the township spoke only their home language, but I learned several languages because I grew up in a house where there was no option but to learn them. My mom made sure English was the first language I spoke. If you're black in South Africa, speaking English is the one thing that can give you a leg up. English is the language of money. English comprehension is equated with intelligence. If you're looking for a job, English is the difference between getting the job or staying unemployed. If you're standing in the dock, English is the difference between getting off with a fine or going to prison. After English, exosa was the what we spoke around the house. When my mother was angry, she'd fall back on her home language. As a naughty child, I was well-versed in exosa threats. They were the first phrases I picked up, mostly for my own safety. Phrases like, Nidiza, Kabuta, and Toloko. I'll knock you upside the head. Or, Sindega Nindia Santuana, you idiot of a child. It's a very passionate language. Outside of that, my mother picked up different languages here and there. She learned Zulu because it's similar to Xosa. She spoke German because of my father. She spoke Afrikaans because it is useful to know the language of your oppressor. Sotho, she learned in the streets, living with my mom, I saw how she used language to cross boundaries, handle situations, navigate the world. We were in a shop once, and the shopkeeper right in front of us turned to his security guard and said in Afrikaans, Volg dai suertes nintuyo steal hulia eats. Follow those blacks in case they steal something. My mother turned around and said in beautiful, fluent Af Afrikaans, 
Hukum vir li dini swerti sode ju alkan helokrenu hule sikini. I am really botching these. I'm sorry. Why don't you follow these blacks so you can help them find what they're looking for? Ah, Jamar, he said, apologizing. And Africans. Then, and this was the funny thing, he didn't apologize for being racist. He merely apologizes for aiming his racism at us. Oh, I'm so sorry, he said. I thought you were like the other blacks. You know how they love to steal. I learned to use language like my mother did. I would simulcast, give you the program in your own tongue. I'd get suspicious looks from people just walking down the street. Where are you from, they'd ask. I would reply in whatever language they'd address me in, using the same accent that they used. There would be a brief moment of confusion, and then the suspicious look would disappear. Oh, okay, I thought you were a stranger. We're good, then. It became a tool that served me my whole life. One day, as a young man, I was walking down the street, and a group of Zulu guys was walking behind me, closing in on me, and I could hear them talking to one another about how they were going to mug me. Esumbe li ayuti yomlunga. Fuma, Nagfa, Mina, Nazugoma, Nigivima, Kwaki. Let's get this white guy. You go to his left and I'll come up behind him. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't run, so I just spun around real quick and said, Quota, Bafuini, Yongani, Sigivi, Simbabi, Unumutu, Inkuzuni, Azimini, Minya, Nunkuli. You guys, why don't we just mug someone together? I'm ready. Let's do it. They looked shocked for a moment, and then they started laughing. Oh, sorry, dude. We thought you were something else. We weren't trying to take anything from you. We were trying to steal from white people. Have a good day, man. They were ready to do me violent harm until they felt we were a part of the same tribe, and then we were cool. That and so many other small incidents in my life made me realize that language, even more than color, defines who you are to people. I became a chameleon. My color didn't change, but I could change your perception of my color. I didn't look like you. But if I spoke like you, I was you. As apartheid was coming to an end, South Africa's elite private school started accepting children of all colors. My mother's company offered scholarships for underprivileged families, and she managed to get me into Maryvale College, an expensive private Catholic school. Classes taught by nuns, mass on Fridays, the whole bit. I started preschool there when I was three, primary school when I was five. In my class, we had all kinds of kids, black kids, white kids, Indian kids, colored kids, most of the white kids were pretty well off. Every child of color pretty much wasn't. But because of scholarships, we were we all sat at the same table. We wore the same maroon blazers, the same gray slacks and skirts. We had the same books. We had the same teachers. There was no racial separation. Every clique was racially mixed. Kids still got teased and bullied, but it was over usual kid stuff, being fat or being skinny, being tall or being short, being smart or being dumb. I don't remember anybody being teased about their race. I didn't learn to put limits on what I was supposed to like or not like. I had a wide berth to explore myself. I had crushes on white girls. I had crushes on black girls. Nobody asked me what I was. I was Trevor. It was a wonderful experience to have, but the downside was that it sheltered me from reality. Mary Vale was an oasis that kept me from the truth, a comfortable place where I could avoid making a tough decision. But the real world doesn't go away. Racism exists. People are getting hurt. And just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening. And at some point, you have to choose black or white. Pick a side. You can try to hide from it. You can say, oh, I don't pick sides. But at some point, life will force you to pick a side. At the end of sixth grade, I left Maryvale to go to H.A. Jack Primary, a government school. I had to take an aptitude test before I started. And based on the results of the test, the school counselor told me, you're going to be in the smart classes, the A classes. I showed up for the first day of school and went to my classroom. Of the 30 or so kids in my class, almost all of them were white. There was one Indian kid, maybe one or two black kids, and me. Then recess came. We went out on the playground and black kids were everywhere. It was an ocean of black, like someone had opened up a tap and all the black had come pouring out. I was like, where were they all hiding? The white kids I'd met that morning, they went in one direction. The black kids went in another direction. I was left standing in the middle, totally confused. I did not understand what was happening. I was 11 years old, and it was like I was seeing my country for the first time. In the townships, you don't see segregation because everyone is black. In the white world, anytime my mother took me to a white church, we were the only black people there, and my mom didn't separate herself from anyone. She just didn't care. She'd go right up and sit with the white people. And at Maryvale, the kids were mixed up and hanging out together. Before that day, I had never seen people being together and yet not together, occupying the same space, yet choosing not to associate with each other in any way. 
In an instant, I could see, I could feel how the boundaries were drawn. Groups moved in color patterns across the yard, up the stairs, down the hall. It was insane. I looked over at the white kids I'd met that morning. Ten minutes earlier, I thought I was at a school where they were a majority. Now I realized how few of them there actually were. I stood there awkwardly by myself in this no man's land in the middle of the playground. Luckily, I was rescued by the Indian kid from my class, a guy named Thiessen Pillay. Thiessen was one of the few Indian kids in school, so he'd noticed me, another obvious outsider, right away. He ran over to introduce himself. Hello, fellow anomaly. You're in my class. Who are you? What's your story? We started talking and hit it off. He took me under his wing, the artful dodger to my bewildered Oliver. Through our conversation, it came up that I spoke several African languages, and Thiessen thought a colored kid speaking black language was, was the most amazing trick. He brought me over to a group of black kids. Say something, he told them, and he'll show you he understands. One kid said something in Zulu, and I replied to him in Zulu. Everyone cheered. Another kid said something in Exosa, and I replied to him in Exosa. Everyone cheered. For the rest of recess, Thesis took me around to different black kids on the playground. Show them your trick. Do your language thing. The black kids were fascinated. It wasn't common to find a white or colored person who spoke African languages. The fact that I did speak them immediately endeared me to the black kids. How come you speak your own languages? They asked, because I'm black, I said, like you. You're not black. Uh, yes, I am. No, you're not. Have you seen yourself? They were confused at first because of my color. They thought I was a colored person, but speaking the same languages meant that I belonged to their tribe. It just took them a moment to figure it out. It took me a moment, too. At some point, I turned to one of them and said, hey, how come I don't see you guys in any of my classes? It turned out they were in the B classes, which also happened to be the black classes. That same afternoon, I went back to the A classes, and by the end of the day, I realized that they weren't for me. Suddenly, I knew who my people were, and I wanted to be with them. I went to see the school counselor. I'd like to switch over, I told her. I'd like to go to the B classes. She was confused. Oh, no, she said, I, I don't think you want to do that. Why not? Because those kids are, you know, no, I, I don't know. What do you mean? Look, she said, you're a smart kid. You don't want to be in that class. But aren't the classes the same? English is English. Math is math. Yeah, but those, those kids are going to hold you back. But surely there must be some smart kids in the B class. No, there aren't. But all my friends are there. You don't want to be friends with those kids. Yes, I do. We went back and forth, and finally she gave me a stern warning. You do realize the effects this will have on your future. You do understand what you're giving up. This will impact the opportunities you'll have open to you for the rest of your life. I'll take that chance. I moved to the B classes with the black kids. I decided I'd rather be held back with people I liked uh, instead of move ahead with people I didn't know. Being at H.A. Jack made me realize I was black. Before that recess, I'd never had to choose. But when I was forced to choose, I chose black. The world saw me as colored, but I didn't spend my life looking at myself. I spent my life looking at other people. I saw myself as the people around me, and the people around me were black. My cousins are black. My mom is black. My gran is black. I grew up black. Because I had a white father, because I'd been in white Sunday school, I got along with the white kids, but I didn't belong with the white kids. I wasn't a part of their tribe. But the black kids embraced me. With the black kids, I was constantly trying to be. I'm sorry, with the white kids, I was constantly trying to be. With the black kids, I just was.